Hello and welcome to the Ahama Pulse webcast and sorry for the short delay due to technical issues but now we are here with you and we're looking forward to another webcast where we discuss the trends that shape and change the process industries and you can be part of it. Just join via Slido with the hashtag Ahama Pulse, ask your questions and I'll take them right to my expert and we will take them into our discussion. Everything's going digital, not least Ahama. Ahama Pulse is online already, the platform is open, and we're looking forward to meeting you there. But we are not the only ones striving for more digitalization. The chemical industry and the process industries in general are doing so too. But what is digitalization really about? Is it just about introducing some smart IT system systems or is it much more? Well, I think it's a larger journey, a longer journey with a lot of steps. And one company that has embarked on this journey a couple of years ago already is Solvay. And it's my pleasure to talk today with the global head of digital operations at Solvay. Welcome, Kiri Kataraj. Welcome, everyone. So it's a pleasure for me to be invited today to tell you uh, our journey towards the vision we have of the plant of the future. Thierry, we are really excited to hear more about it. And as I just said, digitalization is more than just some smart IT systems. And you told me it's much more than artificial intelligence as well. So could you describe the journey Solvay is taking? What is your path towards digitalization? So I have a few slides to go through uh, our journey. And so, yeah, that's yeah perfect. Coming. So I think that for us, as you explained, it's really a journey. It's not only a technical stuff. And we started by building our vision. You know, a, a collective exercise with uh, many people from the industrial side. And for us, the vision is that the future, the plant is something that uh, really is uh, emotionally positive for people. I mean, we have to be proud working in a chemical plant. So uh, security of the people accessing the site, the security of the infrastructure is key, but also the respect of the planet. So you see all this sustainability aspect is there. Of course, it's uh, a system with lots of components, so everything has to be under control, and that's where you will find lots of artificial intelligence capabilities, so predictable, reliable, and so on. But you also see, and then the COVID was a good lesson for us, how fast the world is changing. So we need to be more agile, more flexible, to be able to answer to a, an ever-changing world. So this is really the vision we have for the plan of the future, could be 2030. And so starting from there, we look together, how can we create value? What are the uh, driver for this digital transformation? And this is a number of them. Huh? Of course, we all think of asset performance, uh, how to increase the yield through poor quality. And there, of course, you all think of data analytics. And that's where artificial intelligence can be a cherry on the cake. But of course, also working on the asset network within the sites or across the sites, and all the logistics aspects and dynamic optimization algorithms. If you look at the maintenance, we need to be more data-based to give the asset reliability good enough, and then you see all the predictive maintenance aspects. Don't forget the digital workforce. They are still and they will be part, a key element of the plant of the future. And the interaction between human and technology is a subject of interest. And at the last, you will find all those technological inventions like robotics, robotics, drone, 3D printers, and how to connect all those ones. And the value creation for us is not only cash. It could be safety, it could be working condition, it could be uh, you know, uh, on time in full for delivery. So all those aspects have to be included in, in the journey. And when we look at the transformation, because for us it's a real transformation, it has to go along three main pillars. Of course, the technical systems, so all the algorithms and all the computers and the uh, you know, in, internet of things, anything like this. But as any, any uh, you know, high level sportsman, you need to measure your performance to understand where do you improve yourself and the plan. 
And this is performance management, and it's also important to measure that. And the last but not least are the people themselves, the mindset, the behavior. Because if you don't improve them, you make a transformation, but it's not sustainable. And what is new compared to lean management that we were activating 10 years ago, it's the data. All the richness of data that we now have in our hands. And looking at the data, what we have found is, in fact, in our classical, uh, I would say, education, we have new profiles appearing. So if we simplify it and, and you look at the, the three uh, bullets here, huh, you see uh, on the bottom the domain expertise, huh, process, process control, engineer, scientist. You have the IT and computer science that we already had in place, but now there is an additional domain coming on. Uh, it started by being data analytics, but now it moves more and more in machine learning and artificial intelligence. And then you see in the intersection of these mathematical bubbles, you see new roles appearing. So you know the data scientists, people are always claiming they need them, but you need also data translator explaining to a data scientist what technical problem he has to solve. And the same on data engineers, for example, which are between the data databases, data repository, and the domain of expertise. And so if you look on the right, it's a kind of sketch where you see starting from the bottom, the process chemical engineering and, and the pyramid of acquiring data and not only acquiring data, but using data to create value. And that's where you see uh, the advanced process control, the manufacturing execution system or SCADA, the ERP, and then on top of them, the optimization at the big industrial scale. And to make it successful, uh, those people have to work together, to talk to each other, and of course, uh, collaboration there is really uh, key. So this, this is more or less the sketch of, of the transformation. So we started in a number of sites, and now we are scaling up to deploy those methodology and, and uh, lessons learned in the more and more sites uh, of, the, of the group. Okay, this was a general presentation, so uh, happy to answer uh, the questions uh, you may have. Great, Thierry. Thank you very much. And I think it's a very systemic approach that you're taking here. Um, a lot of aspects in there. If you have questions in the audience on this concept, on the road of Solvay towards digitalization, post them on Slido and I'll take them right here. And I start, Thierry, you have described the vision that is at the end of your journey or of Solvay's journey towards digitalization. How far would you say are you on that journey? Well, what I did here is really to focus the journey on, on the digital operations. At the same time, we are starting an equivalent journey on the customer engagement model, because customers, of course, are key. Without customers, we wouldn't be there. And also on the, on the connected research part. Uh, so we, we are moving ahead huh, with, uh, in 2016, building a vision, 2017, launching a number of proof of concepts but already in 2019, building a methodology and deploying in a number of sites. And we have gone through a, a real transformation of above 20 sites, 20 industrial sites. One of the lessons is that you can't jump from let's say level one to level four at once. You have to do it progressively. So we move from, uh, I would say no culture on data to a good culture. And then next time you, you move ahead to another level. So you have to take one step after the other. There's exactly. no such thing as a complete turnaround. Otherwise, it's, it's, uh, the gap is too big for people. They, they need to be acquainted to using data more and more, using mobile devices. And once they use it for a while, then themselves, they come with propositions, asking new uh, applications and new ideas, and then you can climb to the next level. Are these also the main hurdles, taking people with you, or is it more a technological thing? What, what were the basic barriers that you met? Well, in fact, we, we have defined five main ingredients uh, that I could detail maybe next time. Huh? So the five ingredients, if one of them is missing, in fact, you cannot succeed. But of course, you have the basic infrastructure. Huh? If you want people to have the right information at the right time anywhere, you need mobile devices, you need a 4G, maybe 5G in the future. So if you don't have that one available, okay, you have to invest. 
But once those infrastructure are in place, you need to bring people to the right level. Mm. And that's uh, probably one of the big difficulties to create those multidisciplinary teams, having them working together and, and create a dynamic of, of uh, progress along those data and machine learning systems. That's where the first question from our audience comes in as well. Um, as you mentioned, the importance of people, how do you deal with the fear that artificial intelligence and digitalization might make humans superfluous? I might lose my workplace if I'm going digital. Yeah, I know that that's certainly one of the first questions that is coming from the trade unions. Huh? But I guess that the way we did it is to embark everyone in the journey since the beginning. So when we go to a new site, the first thing that we do is a digital awareness session. And for two hours, we bring all the teams from the site, one by one, across that training, explaining that what we have done elsewhere, showing them what will change in their own life, because nobody wants to make the same you know, repetitive action day after day. So yes, we can release some of those painful actions, Uh, and once they understand that what we want to do is to grow together, that we will upskill the people, that there will be lots of training for them, then they are part of the journey. If you have more questions, just post them. But I want to ask a question that might be a bit unusual, maybe, but we are always talking about hurdles. Did you encounter any unexpected benefits? Yes. In fact, It's funny, eh? but in most of the cases in the past, industry was ahead of the rest of the, I would say, the population in terms of technical device and so on. But once we started in 2017 proof of concept, and we were a bit afraid introducing, you know, tablets and smartphones in the plants and saying, okay, we will have to train people how to use it. And in fact, we were completely uh, against the, the real cases. I mean, people are all using smartphones at home. And so when we told them, yes, you will have to learn, they said, no, no, don't, don't teach me. I know how, how to do it. So uh, I, I, my question was, when will I be able to use apps during my work time? <laughs> so that was a, a real surprise. And so many people were happy that at least they were able to, to do uh, those types of interaction that they were used to do at home. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I never thought about that, actually. But it's true. We're getting used to using our smart appliances everywhere. Why not at work? Um, do you, for, for, the, for the roles that you have described, the different uh, people you need now, the specifications that differ a bit from the classical process engineer or, or chemist, do you implement these roles by developing your own people or do you bring new people in for this? That's a very good question because it's, it's not so easy to understand what are the specificities of some of those roles. Huh? So what we try to do, for example, in terms of uh, process engineering, is to uh, focus on the background, meaning First of all, you need to master process engineering. So you need to come from a chemical engineering degree, typically. And then we learn to people how to use data, how to do you know, neural networks analysis and things like this. But of course, they won't bring, that won't bring them to the level of data scientists. I mean, they will allow them, them to work with data scientists. Data scientists are clearly profiled that we recruit uh, on, on the market. Now, we don't have them internally. So it's really a mix of internal upskilling of people with the correct background and recruitment of external specialists in, in some of those fields. On your second slide, I think it was, you described the different stakeholder groups a bit because a lot of different requests are met by digitalization, customers, employees, um, well, investors. Um, which of the stakeholder groups would you say is the main driver for digitalization? Uh, for, for the Solvay Group, clearly, uh, sustainability is the key driver. Because we really uh, feel that internally or externally, sustainability is what people are willing to do. So if you want someone to work on a system where he will reduce water intake from a site, I mean, people are all willing to do that. So it's not forced, but they are willing to do it. And we see that uh, the Solvay Group has an engagement and sustainability, which is very strong. 
And so it's a real good driver to bring people around the table, to collect all the ideas uh, and have also money, capex investment available to, to, to make that, uh, that change. So I think for us, sustainability is surely the, the, the first driver. The second one at the same level of importance is safety. Because we want people leaving the site in the evening in the same shape they were entry in the morning. Mm -hmm. So I think that's key. Anything that can help on safety is surely uh, number one. And once more, we see how everything interlocks, all those big trends in the process industry, sustainability, digitalization, safety, of course, is always uh, an issue. So it all connects. Thank you very much, Kiri, for this insight into Solvay's journey. And we will learn more two weeks from now at Ahama Pulse. I'm really looking forward to it and to hearing more details, asking more questions, answering more questions. So see you there. Thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you very much, Catherine. And for all of you who still have questions left, Ahama Pulse is the chance to ask them. And you can sign on the platform right now because it is already open. Just go to the Ahma website, get your ticket and start exploring the wealth of information you find there from over 900 exhibitors. And on 15th and 16th of June, we have a fireworks of live events, discussions, panels, talks. You can ask your questions. You can join the discussion on all the topics that we covered in the webcasts and all the topics that concern the process industry. So I'm really excited to see you there at Ahama Pulse.